In this episode, we are joined with Dr. Mireille Pardon to discuss the development and implementation of medieval law and jurisprudence, the relationship between the secular and ecclesial authorities in matters of law, as well as popular misconceptions that some may have today regarding law and jurisprudence in the Middle Ages. Dr. Pardon is an assistant professor in the history department specializing in violence, social control, and judicial ritual in late medieval and early modern Europe. Dr. Pardon completed her undergraduate degrees in history at Princeton University and immediately completed her MA and PhD and PhD degrees in history from Yale University. Dr. Pardon, thank you so much for joining with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's so fascinating to discuss like the medieval conceptions of law and, and, and legality and jurisprudence, because I think that that very often it's it, it, it's very far removed from how we might understand law as it's implemented and practiced today, like contemporary jurisprudence, though there might be different differences, significant differences and projected misconceptions about what, what how medieval law worked mm-hmm. in, the, in the Middle Ages. Um, and yeah, I, I figured we could try to like get get rid of the, the, those, those, those misconceptions. Yeah, well, that that is a giant topic for one podcast episode, but I'm, I'm excited to try it with you. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, I figured we, we might start off with maybe some laying some groundwork on, on the topic and, and maybe start off by discussing, you know, the different legal codes um, that the medievals drew from to discuss in, in discussions of, of law and jurisprudence. So what were the medieval legal codes that maybe early medieval law was based upon? Were any of these, you know, codes based off of Roman legal codes or Germanic legal codes? I mean, what, what can you say to that? Yeah, yeah. So in in the early Middle Ages, you do have this kind of slight survival of Roman law in certain locations. Um, and so, for example, Visigothic law codes are very heavily based in Roman law. Um, and also you have, for a period of time, uh, parts of Italy are actually under control of the sort of Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire. So the Roman law, of course, happening there. Um, and as probably many of your listeners already know, the beginning of the Middle Ages is, of course, defined by the disintegration of the Western part of the Roman Empire. But just because that disintegrated doesn't mean everyone immediately forgot all of the law that was being implemented in a lot of those areas. Um, and so because of that, we do have some early law codes that sometimes have like slight influences of Roman law, even if they aren't actually applying Roman law. Um, so from the early Middle Ages, we have these sometimes called like barbarian or Germanic law codes that appear. Um, the most famous example is the Salic laws. Um, but also during that time period you sometimes still had people doing roman law in those areas because there was the concept of the personality of the law where if you were defined as a roman then you would be subject to roman law whereas if you were defined as a salian frank you would be subject to the salic laws um, which is quite different than later more territorial conceptions of law which are what is guiding most of medieval judicial practice but in the early middle ages you do have this strange sort of personality of the law going on which means that Roman law is kind of surviving in areas that are no longer part of the Roman Empire. Um, But in terms of sort of the main law codes, if I could give sort of the big three, um, would probably be uh, Roman law and its sort of strange early survival, and then also after the 12th century, after sort of the famous rediscovery of Roman law, which we can sort of table that to talk about um, in a very different way, um, Roman law being sort of one, and then kind of like customary Germanic law being kind of individual law codes that survive just in various regions, often through oral tradition, but then at certain points, get written down and sometimes get kind of compiled together. Um, And then canon law as a sort of other very specific form of legal practice that is also kind of gets systematized around the 12th century. Um, You have sort of more of one code to go to versus earlier periods where it's definitely thought of as a concept of, well, we're consulting canon law right now, but still is a little, can look sort of different in different places of what exactly they're consulting for canon law. Right, right. I mean, that is interesting what, what you say about how like, the different law codes go through period periods of systemization and development, um, especially in the twelfth in the twelfth centuries. Is there a reason why that particular period we get th- this period? Of, does that have anything to do with the medieval universities or 
or, or yes, they, it has okay. a lot of medieval universities. Um, yeah, so I think, like anything, there's sort of many causes that one could point to for what's exactly causing this change and how people are thinking about the law. Um, but certainly medieval universities are one of them, and then it's at medieval universities that people are very much kind of invested in studying the law, studying the law as a system, um, and then those people going out and actually sort of being advisors to courts and actually practicing the law. Um, and when medieval universities are sort of becoming a thing in the 12th and 13th centuries, that's something that is related to this change in legal practice. Um, it's also though not unrelated to um, sort of rising church power and uh, battles between sort of church and state power um, that sort of following on the Gregorian form, having all these sort of disagreements about who's sort of in charge of what, that's also a driving force for both the study of canon law and well as the study of Roman law. And both sides are kind of drawing from Roman law to try to make arguments for why they should have more power in society, whether it's sort of the Holy Roman Emperor or the Pope. So there are definitely sort of political things going on, larger sort of broader things with sort of scholasticism and universities, um, and probably other things as well. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it, it is interesting to see how how a lot of changes with respect to what exactly is the relationship between different bishops and and and, and the relationship to the pope versus what particular mm -hmm. uh, uh, civil authority that they're, they're currently under. There's a lot of legal battles that happen over this conflicting issue because it's it's always a, a contest to determine like who has more power. And eventually, as I understand it, uh, especially the papacy as it's growing, will even make claims that all like secular authorities are under their under their dominion as it were sort of like vassals to like a higher vassal as it were yeah 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 no they're definitely <laughs> they're definitely folks that do make that argument um especially sort of after the sort of rise of papal power um there are definitely some very sort of firm statements of it is the pope who is actually higher than any sort of temporal power right right and there's also as i understand it there's this concept of these two swords that 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 effectively are, are given out and bequeathed to, to just certain rulers, but mm -hmm. the church always theoretically has the power to sort of take them back for, for, for itself. Yeah, yeah, I think the doctrine of the two swords is really interesting as a political theory because it is subject to so many sort of different interpretations across the medieval across the medieval period because it is this very kind of like ancient theory and that it's a, originally I think a fifth century pope um, Galatius who like originally states it, but then everyone who's sort of referring back to it, it can be sort of used to either support secular power in terms of saying like oh well there are two swords this is clearly a temporal bow a temporal issue so get out of here or to sort of support superior, superior spiritual power in terms of oh well they're two swords but the spiritual sword is the one that actually matters so it is definitely one of those things where both sides will be using the same kind of like political theory um but they can sort of come to different conclusions about it right right absolutely and then i i, I know one thing that that i'm very interested in in discussing with you is necessarily how exactly law is maybe uh, implemented as it were. So we, so we talked about a bit about the codes of, of law and the different strands you might say of, of of legal codes, but how exactly is it implemented with respect to like the ruling or the warrior class? I mean, how, how exactly does that work? I mean, my, my knowledge of that that relationship is is mostly predicated on, you know, the system of vassalage, but I don't know how that necessarily extends to like the legal realm as it were. Yeah, yeah. So this system of vassalage is actually very sort of key to how law is being implemented throughout most of the Middle Ages, though I will say that the medieval period in general, things are always sort of subject to what specific kind of time and place you're talking about. Sure. Um, but in general, in tip that typical sort of lord vassal relationship of this sort of like mutual uh, obligation, one of the obligations of a lord, both a lord to a vassal, but also a lord, like a manorial lord to sort of peasant community, is dispensing of justice. Um, and so you would have a court that ostensibly is supposed to be run by the person who's in charge of your area, whether that's sort of your lord vassal relationship or sort of a more a lord, uh, the people who are living on his land sort of relationship. Um, and that actually also relates to financial relationships as well, um, in the same way that in kind of like a manorial system, a lord might charge for sale using the communal oven or something like that in a peasant community. Um, lords also collect a lot of money through the judicial system. Um, so it is something that is, he's, it's sort of his responsibility to be offering. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's the one making judicial decisions. He might have kind of like a giant bureaucratic legal staff or something of that nature. Um, but it does mean that it is his responsibility, according to kind of like feudal understandings of our relationships, to be providing access to a court. Um, and his, his responsibility is like, you know, hire people to be running that court, but also means that he's collecting money for people who are then paying a lot of legal fees that often ultimately are going to him. I see. Oh, okay. And, and 
how exactly w would that system work? Maybe more. So I can understand how that might system might work for like major cities, but what about like you might say the more rural oh, countryside? So, oh, sorry, yeah. go ahead. So let's say actually it doesn't work for major cities. So sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> flip that okay. around. Okay, um, okay. Yeah. So this is actually more. Yeah. So the system I was describing is actually a lot more characteristic of the countryside oh. um, versus. Yeah, so cities, we could define a city, well, it kind of depends on the city, but so we could define a city based on just population, right? Like it has X number of people, maybe it has walls, we're going to call that a city. Um, but we could also define a city as a legal entity um, that has like a charter that grants it urban rights and privileges. Um, and so a, it's very common for cities in the Middle Ages to be defined by the fact that they have access to a town court that's not associated with a lord. So they might be technically within the realm of sort of a, a given nobleman uh, who does have some responsibilities towards them and they have some responsibilities to him, but they've been granted this charter at some point in time. And that charter grants them freedom from feudal obligations. So they don't have to do the sort of feudal labors that uh, peasant communities do. Um, but it also grants them things like running their own court. Okay, interesting. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand, that was initially the relationship that that London may have had w w w with some of the the Plantagenet kings like I remember reading somewhere that I think it was Richard the first a lot of his uh Richard the Lionheart a lot of his like money that that was used to bail him out of a, a prison was raised by the London citizens and a lot of privileges that were then granted to L the, the mm -hmm. city of, uh, uh, of London on account of that w w would you say that, 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 that that's what happened for the majority of cities or yeah, so it's very dependent on like where you sort of are geographically. Um, and but the idea of sort of having something that's granted and while a city could be kind of asking for it, it is ultimately something that has to be granted to them, um, usually in the form of a charter. Um, but it is these are these sort of privileges that are often tied to, to uh, like sort of historical moment in time when they were being granted. Um, okay. Sort of rights and privileges. With respect to maybe with respect to the system of like manorialism in, in, in the early Middle Ages and the peasant class, I mean, how exactly was law implemented? With respect to that, uh, I know we talked about mm -hmm. the warrior class. Now speaking to like the peasantry, mm -hmm. how exactly did that work? Yeah, so ostensibly peasants are supposed to be of whoever is sort of like the lord of their manor um, is supposed to be sort of providing them with a court that they can go to. Um, though there are some peasant communities that are sort of organizing things a little more locally as well. Um, okay. So also, I think another thing about medieval justice more generally um, is that you do have sort of both formal and informal practice. Um, and a lot of people would have kind of like forms of uh, agreements that are kind of going outside of sort of like private agreements that are going outside of sort of access to a regular court. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be something that also could be sort of a lot of that going on. And certainly you have people, um, professing communities, definitely I do know that people do have kind of local leadership. Um, that are not always, sometimes are directly connected to kind of the idea of a local manor, but sometimes they're less connected. They're just kind of like local kind of like village captains, sort of, I who see. also might be kind of resolving disputes in their community in a way that's a lot more informal than kind of like, oh, this is clearly a kind of a quote unquote real dispute. We need to actually go to our sort of formal law court. Well, it is interesting how the Middle Ages, the medieval law focused on resolving disputes and conflicting like parties and disagreements, mm -hmm. because I, that conception of law. Uh, you might say, I don't want to say unfortunately, well, unfortunately, it is not necessarily how law might be practiced today. It, 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 it's, it's much more, the focus is much more on like resolving conflicting parties. That, 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 that's seen as the end goal of, of law, as it were. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of medieval law that's um, very much based on someone has to sort of go somewhere to seek justice. And mm -hmm. sometimes that could be kind of two people going together, of like, oh, we have this issue, we need a resolution. Um, versus modern law is much more based on someone did something wrong, we need to sort of go and find them and mm -hmm. kind of just have, have them face consequences for doing something wrong versus there's an issue in this community, those both people are coming forward and are seeking some sort of reconciliation. And in general, I think medieval law has a lot of um, uh, sort of peace agreements um, in a way that that's not something that sort of exists in that form today. I mean, you can kind of like negotiate a settlement with someone. Um, but the idea that, for example, for homicide, um, you have a lot of peace agreements for homicide at sort of th throughout the Middle Ages, even in the late Middle Ages, when you have these sort of very established bureaucratic procedures um, and sort of what's kind of called Romano canonical procedure that's kind of, that's very inquisitorial. So it's sort of a judge going in and trying to find people. Um, even under those systems, once those get built up, you still have a lot of peace agreements being made between individuals, even for a crime kind of as important, I guess, as homicide. I see. 
And then another one more question I want, I figured we, we, we discussed one more question about like inter introducing the concept of, of medieval law mm -hmm. before we, we discuss maybe some some popular misconceptions. One one interesting legal activity that is conducted during this period is understanding marriage as a legal practice, as a legal activity. I mean, obviously, ecclesial authorities see, see marriage sacramentally, but but in, in the legal realm, the, the, this has also marriage has all sorts of legal ramifications that, 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 that that's enacted. And, and how how was marriage understood as a legal activity? Were, were there codes that, that, that would establish like what you could or couldn't do with respect to marriage? Yeah. So the majority of legislation that we have on marriage from the medieval period is coming out of canon law. Um, and I think this is actually an area that shows just how much canon law had an impact on sort of the everyday lives of people. Because I think that when we think of sort of canon law today, because canon law still does exist today, it right. just doesn't matter for most people. Right. Um, but in the Middle Ages, canon law is sort of legislating marriage and particularly telling are people allowed to get married or are marriages allowed to be dissolved? Um, so like major things like how, how much you can be related to someone. So a lot of uh, canon law manuscripts actually have these really beautiful consanguinity trees um, that are very kind of highly decorated and oh, wow. you could use to sort of count up the degrees of allowed relationships. So something for people listening to Google later. Uh, they're quite pretty. Um, so, but yeah, so things like uh, degrees of relationship, um, then sort of the, like ever, both people have to be of age, obviously, in order to get married. Um, you can't have like a sort of prior betrothal agreement or something you're going back on. Um, you can't have, there are other issues that can solve a marriage that I'm not thinking of right now. Um, but anyway, there, there are these sort of different requirements, whether marriage can be built, and then the, it would be a canon law court that would decide something like that. Mm, right, right. Yeah, it's very interesting that you mention uh, laws uh, prohibiting consanguinity and, and those sorts of issues, because sometimes in the popular mind, we might think of like, you know, the medieval, you know, marriage system as like, uh, you know, unfortunate series of like, cases of incest and things of that sort and but actually that that, that was something that they that the, the, the middle ages the the, the, yeah, the church rather cared a lot about <laughs> exactly exactly yeah and what's even more interesting i i found is sometimes the the, the case of like annulment and, and, and divorce is kind of a hairy subject in in, in the middle ages mm -hmm. but 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 they would sometimes consanguinity charges would be brought up if one member of a, 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 a party in, in a marriage wanted to dissolve it. Like, I think that was the case with um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, famously, that, that she dissolved her marriage to, yeah. to marry Henry. Yeah, right. and I think that is a case that also shows kind of the difference between, like, sort of the letter of the law versus social custom, um, and that there probably were people getting married who were in violation of consanguinity. Because consanguinity, especially because consanguinity includes, there's also sort of a spiritual affinity. So it's including not just um, who you're blood related to, it's also related to who your godparents are. It's also related to who anyone in your family is married to. Um, so, for example, like two brothers and two sisters aren't allowed to kind of marry each other, um, even though they aren't blood related. It's like an in-law relationship. Uh, so because when you take all those things into account, it's I mean, obviously, you could also you know, Eleanor Agatha's cases where people actually are blood related. But there are actually a lot of cases where you sort of wonder if maybe two people got married and then one of them wants out and they remember, oh, wait, actually, we have these other vague family members who are married to each other, I can bring that to my local court and get out of this situation. Right, right, exactly. And, and but, 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 in addition to issues of consanguinity, there were also very interesting disputes with respect to the age of 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 when you could get married or, or when it was practical to to get married. Because I know another my popular conception we, we might have in the Middle Ages, and maybe you could tell us if that conception is correct, mm -hmm. is this idea of, of, of like child marriages and like the nobles would very quickly mm -hmm. marry the, the, their children off to form political alliances and those sorts of things. And leaving aside that that's more of a question of the nobility and less of a problem for like everyday peasant peasantry, would you say that that is, is accurate? I mean, w were child marriages a thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so according to the letter of the law, it's um, 12 for girls and 14 for boys. So that obviously oh, is like okay. quite, quite young. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, so that's according to medieval canon law. Um, however, that was quite uncommon. Um, and among the nobility, you do have like sort of teenage marriages or marriages that are getting sort of near that level. Uh, and you also have uh, betrothals happening sort of before that or sort of agreements being made of who is going to get married. Um, you also sometimes have cases where people would be sort of technically married until they were when they were sort of directly of age, but then they wouldn't actually be kind of living together as man and wife until a few years later. Hmm. So you also have things like that where it does seem like people did have kind of concerns about this or were sort of uncomfortable with the idea of a 12 year old getting married. Um, right. 
And so that was definitely something that was sort of under consideration, um, though also certainly among sort of the upper nobility, people did get married younger than people are perhaps comfortable with people getting married today. Right. Um, but as you say, it is something that is more about the sort of aristocracy and nobility and sort of, um, than it is about most people in the general population in the Middle Ages. Because um, I think sometimes people have this conception that, oh, everyone in the Middle Ages was getting married sort of as soon as they were entering puberty. And that's right. not super accurate. Um, I think another thing about medieval marriage is that it's another sort of difference between practice and the letter of the law, but may, perhaps going in the opposite direction, is that the letter of the law in terms of canon law is very interested in the concept of mutual consent. That it's only through the, the, it's only through the mutual consent of two parties that a marriage is valid. Um, and so... For example, uh, the Peter Lombard, I think you actually had a uh, podcast episode about Yes, that. Dr. Philip Rosen. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, Peter Lombard actually says that that's all that's necessary for a marriage is just mutual consent and, and nothing else. Um, Gratian's Decretum, for example, the sort of um, famous uh, canon law text from the 1140s that kind of takes sort of authority from that point, um, he says that it's uh, mutual consent plus consummation. Um, so that's adding a little bit more. But anyway, this is all just to say that this emphasis on mutual consent in the letter of the law, obviously, people who were like, for example, members of the nobility and the members of the royal family were also probably subject to, like, obscene social pressure of their parents to marry mm. certain people. So there is sort of maybe a distinction between the letter of the law. It's only by mutual consent of the two parties, and it cannot be coerced. Canon law is very clear about that. But also, arranged marriages did also sort of culturally exist. Mm. For the most of the population, less so than for, for, you know, like, kings and queens and members of the nobility. It was probably more, a lot more important who you married, so there was more pressure. Um, but that's another, I think, sort of interesting example of you know, if you're looking at practice, you might get a different answer versus if you're looking at like, what does a canon lawyer say about what makes a legal marriage and what makes it not legal marriage? Right. Well, I mean, how much pressure did what was there made with respect to the aspect of uh, the, the, the the marriage needs to be judged and whether or not they're they're living together? I asked this question just because, I mean, we had a while ago on Dr. Anthony Bale came on to discuss Marjorie Kemp and how later in life, I think that she, she, she forms agreements with her husband, John, to, that they'll like live in separate places or live apart or yeah. so she can, she can be a, yeah, pilgrim. So she can be a pilgrim. Yeah. 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 So that's actually a common solution to people who can't get their marriage dissolved um, because there's nothing that could technically make their, their marriage invalid according to sort of very strict standards. Um, Cause well, some marriages could be dissolved. Many couldn't. Um, people would just kind of live in separate houses. Um, a marriage being valid by sort of like consummation or something is really just what makes the val marriage valid initially. Um, but besides that, no, you could just live in two houses. Okay. And... I see. Okay. Um, okay. Well, actually, no, I just said that. And now that I'm thinking about it, you do actually have some issues. I remember reading about um, these sort of issues in the late Middle Ages, and it actually does kind of relate to sort of state versus ecclesiastical power of kind of like bishops coming into places and being concerned about people doing this and cracking down on it. Um, but I think the issue was more that they were having other relationships. I think it was oh, okay. more the adultery than the living apart. Okay. I'm not sure living apart could be, while, while a bishop might, might not like it, I'm not sure that can technically be condemned on any real grounds. Okay. Um, I would be wrong, though. But I think it was more about adultery, which is quite easy to condemn. Sure, on, sure. So I see, I see. Grounds. Okay. Maybe I figured we, we might shift course to discussing some of the more popular, like, medieval misconceptions. And before we go into that, I figured, you know, you know, one of the one of, one, one, one of the cool things that, that you've started as maybe like like a trend is is that, that that on social media like you find like examples of how easily misinformation could be spread through the internet and it is unfortunate um uh, I, 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 I know that, that like you, you do a lot of like fun videos on on, on TikTok especially and and and, and sometimes you, you you take a popular video that gets like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of views and you're like okay actually this isn't quite accurate or th there's mm -hmm. more to the story and what what, what 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 can you say to that I mean is 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 it a good idea to yeah. <laughs> get your information from the internet? <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, first of all, I think it's I think it's very depressing sometimes to spend time on TikTok and see just sort of how popular misinformation is, especially about the medieval period. But then again, maybe scholars who are specialists in other periods see it in their own period. So I'm sure it's not just limited to the Middle Ages. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I definitely hope that people are not getting their historical information from the internet. Um, but also, I will say, I guess I have sort of conflicting feelings about it in some ways, because I think that there is a lot of power for social media for scholars to like get ideas out there. Um, hmm. And obviously, 
this is a podcast, so you're doing that with a right, podcast. Right, I was going to say, so wait a minute. Like, this might be a bit hypocritical, right? right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, there is a sort of great power to that in terms of reaching wider audience and also sort of being in communication with what random misconceptions are floating about online. I feel like you can only really combat that if you're also in the online sphere. Mm. Um, you can't really write a research article combating this information online because the people who are getting their information online aren't going to read it. Right. Um, yeah, but it is sort of worrisome the way that and less so about other places on the internet, but more so specifically on TikTok, the way that kind of salacious or sort of sensational facts get spread very quickly over right. someone just saying accurate things in a potentially boring seeming way. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, uh, and and maybe uh, one of the interesting, like, 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 not necessarily like inaccurate, but, 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 but kind of misunderstood problems is, is this question of the use of torture um, implemented in, in medieval jurisprudence. I mean, I know that popularly we kind of think like this was the period of like when torture was, you know, uh -huh. enacted and like to enact confessions or things of that sort. But when exactly, how exactly was the practice of torture mm -hmm. implemented in medieval juris ju jurisprudence? Mm -hmm. Was it only practices to enact confessions? I mean, what, what can you say to that? Yeah. Okay. So torture in medieval law is sort of this very specific thing. And as you say, it is specifically to gain a confession. So it's actually a means of proof. Um, it's not people aren't just sort of torturing people willy nilly. And torture is actually subject to a lot of very specific procedures. Um, and so this is part of we sort of mentioned briefly this kind of uh, legal legal revolution of the 12th century, the sort of rediscovery of Roman law. Um, and there are a lot of kind of effects of that in terms of sort of viewing law as a system, um, sort of a lot more similarity spreading kind of emanating out from sort of the very intense study of law and then being kind of applied differently in different places. Um, so while you do still have the survival of very local traditions, that sort of then being infused with what is sort of sometimes called the Romano-Canonical procedure, these sort of very sort of kind of clear procedure of studying law and, and sort of then implementing law and sort of means of proof, um, which is stemming from Roman law and so canon law. Um, and so as they're kind of more and more often applying these kind of legal concepts coming out of Roman law and trying to do things in a very sort of systematic, rational way, um, that also runs into issues of how do we determine whether or not someone's guilty. Mm -hmm. um, and part of them kind of wanting to, number one, wanting to be really sure that someone's actually guilty and being very interested in having a confession. Um, and number two, getting rid of these sort of so-called irrational forms of proof, um, things like trial by ordeal or trial by combat, which were sometimes the recourse when there isn't another means of proof. So obviously if you have an eyewitness, you have like two eyewitnesses or something, you're not going to use an ordeal um hmm. or if you just have another way of sort of proving something if everyone's just really sure um these are things that only are really being applied if there's just not enough information um similarly then if you're moving to a system where you have a very high you want a very high standard of proof you're no longer using these kind of judicium dei that are asking god to judge for you well what you sort of do in that case and the solution in continental europe is the use of torture to elicit a confession mm -hmm. um and so i think that it's one thing that's interesting about it is these are people who are trying to do things very rationally and systematically. They're trying to kind of improve their current legal system. They're very sort of invested in these rigid procedures. And yet they're doing something that we sort of look at now and are like, this is kind of like scary and barbaric and terrible. Um, and yet it is arising because people are sort of, quote unquote, trying to do things properly. Right. Um, and it is sort of the, the, the result of what some people might call an almost modernization of the law, sort of the systematization of the law. Um, and that sort of sometimes people trying to do things better does not really result in things that everyone might consider to be better. Um, I will say that torture is, well, all torture is awful, to be clear. I don't sound like I'm sort of defending medieval torture as a concept. No one should ever be tortured. Um, it is done in specific circumstances, and it is also done when you already have a little bit of evidence. Um, so it is supposed to be done, for example, if you have like kind of like a half proof. Um, so if you have sort of uh, some sort of substantial circumstantial evidence, or if you have one eyewitness. Okay. Um, you are then allowed to torture someone in order to elicit a confession. Then that confession has to be repeated when they're not under torture. Also, okay. there's sort of some rules about how much, how long you're supposed to torture someone. That doesn't mean these rules were always followed, to be clear. Sure. But, That's yeah. interesting. I mean, I, I, I was always worried about like the possibility of like, you know, inquisitors or, or friars like going around trying to find like heretics. Like I was reading Bernard Guise, like manuals on like mm -hmm. torture and things and he kind of makes it sound like he just goes around like finding people questioning them until they make a mistake and then like fine we found a heretic but that's not how it actually played out in in, in real life necessarily or yeah though also i will say that sort of technical letter of the law how you're supposed to be applying torture might not also always be applied um i also will say that initially 
um, initially members of the clergy are not supposed to be doing right. torture, but then that does get refined. But it is like a specific new rule that has to be made. I mean, it is actually related a little bit to the decline of trial by ordeal in that one of the sort of challenges to trial by ordeal, uh, number one, is that there, people were vaguely discomfortable with, with the idea that you're kind of directly asking God for something, um, that you're like, you're like you as just a random human person, like, hey, God, I need you to solve this for me right now. Mm. Um, that made some sort of theologians uncomfortable. And also the idea that uh, members of the clergy are not supposed to be involved with the shedding of blood. Right, exactly. Um, so trial by ordeal, yeah, it's a very sort of violent thing. Um, in the same way that like canon law courts can't sentence people to execution. They can only, the worst thing they can do is excommunicate someone. Um, and so because of that, people who are members of the clergy, inquisitors, are not supposed to be um, using torture. But then they sort of created this new rule in the 13th century. This pope kind of says, like, oh, well, inquisitors can actually absolve each other of the sin of torturing. So you just have two inquisitors go together. And this is fine it's because heresy is such a problem. <laughs> OK, interesting. OK. Hmm. OK, well, maybe that that, that would help uh, us move into into the next question I was going to ask. I mean, how, how popular or widespread were these so-called trials of ordeal or, or like even trials by combat? I mean. I, I asked this question just because I know, like, I think it was 2021 where, like, there was this movie with, like, Matt Damon, The, 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 the Last Duel, where, where, like, it was about, the last duel. <laughs> right, right, it was about, like, a trial by ordeal, and it actually happened, um, but but were they, were these ways of approaching legal disputes, were they all, like, popular, like, did they, did they decline, as you said, what, what can you say to that? Yeah, yeah. So there definitely is like a chronological decline here um, in that there's sort of the formal prohibition in 1215 at the Fourth Lateran Council um, on these grounds of clergymen not supposed to be involved in the shed of blood. So they get rid of sort of trial by ordeal and trial by combat. That very much doesn't mean that they don't survive after that. Um, they certainly do. I mean, that movie is based on a real event. And that was definitely after 1215. Um, However, they do definitely decline after that. Um, and it becomes sort of a kind of more regional phenomenon of where they're sort of appearing. There's certain jurisdictions that are using them. They're, they're certain that they aren't. Um, I know that there's a, a 13th century compilation of German customary law, the Saxon Spiegel, which sort of mentions conditions under which trial by a deal can still be done. So that's sort of, you know, a secular law that's very formally saying, oh, no, you can still do this. Um, whereas you have sort of the church law saying you're not supposed to do this anymore. Um, though, so it, yeah kind of depends, but definitely there's a sharp decline sort of around the time of this 1214 Fourth Lateran Council. However, interestingly enough, um, trial trial by combat is technically legal in England until 1819. Oh, wow. It, it has totally fallen after use. Like no, no one, no one has done it for centuries. Um, like the last trial by combat in England was like sometime in the Middle Ages. However, it, they have to purposefully make it, it's one of those things where they never made it illegal. Um, so it just kind of survives. And there's a case, um, Ashford v. Thornton, in uh, like sort of 1816 or 1817. So it's a few years before it's formally, they formally get rid of it. Um, and in this case, someone tries to use trial by combat um, and says, well, technically this is legal. Like, I would like to defend myself via combat. Oh. Um, and the other person sort of backed off and said, N never mind, I will withdraw my suit. Um, and then they decided shortly after that. And it was like a big... Um, like a very high profile case. It was a murder trial. So. Okay. One of the concerns, as I understand it, that ecclesial authorities had with respect to trials by combat was that it was sort of seen as like an example of presumption that like, it was presumed that like, if two people if it were, were fighting, God would prevent the one who's not guilty from, they, they, they would triumph. Um, and this would just be up to God's will. But it was kind of seen as like an example of like, presuming that God would do this sorts of this sort of thing and the ecclesial authorities like, yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is sort of one of the main play complaints in addition to this whole sort of not wanting clergy to deal with blood and things. It's also about, this is kind of presumptuous, as you say, to be sort of asking God to do this very specific thing for you as opposed to just sort of wanting God's favor or praying to God. Mm -hmm. It is sort of saying, I want you to, I'm doing this thing, I'm doing this experiment and you need to intervene. Otherwise, someone's going to die. Right, exactly. Right, right. Okay. And then another uh, interesting example, uh, another interesting um, widespread belief about the, the medieval era, at least as I have encountered on, on the internet, is this idea of animal courts, animal accusations, animal sentences in court trials. How exactly widespread, if at all, were these alleged like a court trials towards animals. I mean, are they examples of palimpsest? Did they straight up not happen? I mean, what can you say to that? 
yeah, no, I, I think this is a fascinating topic, number one. Um, but so, uh, number two, though, yes, they did happen, but they were not common. And I think people do have a lot of misconceptions about them. Um, so in terms of secular courts, uh, you do have animals from like the 13th, even until like the 18th century, we have records of animals being executed for killing a person. Um, however, this was hardly, I would say, common, um, but it was definitely something that occurred. And also, I think it's important to point out that it's not as if every animal who ever killed a person was executed by the local executioner. Um, right. So the records that I work with, actually, in my own research are from 15th century Flanders. And one of the things that they include are these records of payments made to the executioner, as well as other sort of penalties and like financial um, penalties that are kind of collected from people. Um, and so it's a really cool source for kind of studying what was happening on the ground um, and studying specifically sort of execution practice. And I have seen uh, one animal being executed, or actually it was two animals. Um, it was two pigs that killed a child. Um, and actually based on my sort of reading from other scholars about it, that is sort of the most common case that it's a pig and that it was a child that was killed. Though you also have examples of other animals and other humans being killed when they would have this um, effect of the animal being executed by the executioner. However, there are also other times that appear in these records where an animal killed someone and there isn't this whole like spectacular justice procedure thing um it's not uncommon in these records for someone's horse to accidentally kill someone either by running into them or throwing a rider and in those cases you see it appear in the records because someone's been fined because their horse killed someone so they, they were considered like a negligent horse owner sometimes the horse can be confiscated um and then sold for the profit of the state but the idea that we're going to put on this whole execution for the horse that doesn't happen so it's clearly not every case where an animal kills someone um these are relatively rare they just sort of appear here periodically in records um and furthermore they're actually condemned by some contemporary law codes um there so there are medieval law codes produced that say oh i've heard that in some places people have been executing animals that's actually a silly thing to do please stop um which okay. in some ways does show actually that it was occurring and like jurists sort of seeing it occurring and writing about it um but the sort of formal legal opinion was for the most part um they're actually some very few exceptional law codes that may seem make it sound a little more complicated than maybe you can sometimes. But for the most part, they say, no, you shouldn't be doing this. Human law as applies to humans. Um, also, there is some reasonable question about, about whether or not these are full-on trials versus just executions. Um, so, for example, the one of the most famous cases of that animal being executed is called the sow with fillets. Um, and often, this is those are the one that I see sort of in popular media a lot. Um, and they often talk about how the sour fillets was like dressed up in human clothing and they had a full on trial and they decided to execute the sour fillets. And there are all these sort of little anecdotes about exactly what happened and why. All of those are inventions of like modern, or modern ish, like, you know, 18th and 19th century historians about when you go to the actual medieval record of this event, it just says the executioner was paid X amount of money for executing a pig who killed a child. Okay. Um, and so it's quite an extrapolation. And so we don't really know to what degree these were fun trial, or if it was more just a local judge deciding this is a dangerous animal who needs to put down, or also maybe not even that, maybe it is sort of more about this is an event that was really tragic in this community, you know, a child died, and we want to sort of do something that would be maybe cathartic as a communal experience. And public execution is awful, but it is also a cathartic human sort of communal experience after a community has appreciated has experienced a tragedy um so there might be sort of that social role that a judge might recognize and say okay maybe we should kind of convict this pig and execute this pig publicly um but that's a little different than having like a lawyer for the pig and sort of Messing going up, through yeah. all the legal procedures right yeah and so and sort of thinking that the pig behaves exactly how a human can and should be following the law. So I think that's a little more murky. Um, though, to be fair, we do know that in ecclesiastical courts, there were f more, um, there were actual trials where they execute excommunicated pests, um, which is another sort of animals in the law court. Right. Uh, though that's also a thing where it's like, well, do they actually think this is doing something or is this more about sort of the ritual and the process of we're going to execute communicate all the rats for example from the town so that also exists but again it's not as if people in the middle ages you know thought animals were humans or were particularly sort of more confused on that front than i think we are because we also decide as governments to put down dangerous animals sometimes the other form of animal executions that exist in the middle ages which are for um this isn't super related but burning things reminded me of it uh, when people are convicted of bestiality in the middle ages they also will often execute the animal Oh, interesting. Um, okay. Which, again, is something that's not, like, super, super common, but it right. is something that happens and is, can be punished in jurisdictions, certain jurisdictions where being burned at the stake, and there are cases where the animal is burned at the stake, sort of alongside the human. I see. Um, 
Okay. Which is another sort of interesting way in which animals are involved in legal matters. Legal okay. Okay. Huh. Yeah. All right, then. Well, I, f I figured maybe I could just ask maybe a, a couple of questions with respect to ecclesial law and, 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 and civil and uh, secular mm -hmm. law. And maybe that then we just end with, with uh, a concluding concluding comments. Um, what exactly was we talked a little bit about how the church would, would sometimes rely on secular law to uh, to execute or, 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 or torture, um, you know, Mm -hmm. they, they would rely on, on that aspect. And we also discussed some of like the disputes with respect to like the Gregorian reforms, lay investiture controversies, the, 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 those mm -hmm. types of things. But I'm just, just thinking out loud, like what exactly was the legal process with respect to like a priest who was seen to have violated some sort of secular judicial mm -hmm. law? Like how did that work? Yeah, yeah. So part of this is actually shows the extent to which canon law kind of mattered and had a giant jurisdiction. So technically, canon law does cover clerics, even if they, for example, like kill someone. Right. Um, so it is supposed to cover them for like sort of any offense that they have, even if it seems like a very secular offense. Um, and so because of that, that is sort of a fairly large, I mean, not fairly, it is, you know, a segment of the population that is being covered by an entirely different law code. Um, and it's supposed to be sort of up to the discretion of their bishop, um, sort of what's supposed to happen to them. Um, what was I going to say about that? Also, this matters for university students. So in terms of um, sort of ecclesiastical versus secular power, uh, I think that we can think about it in terms of like, these, you know, these titans fighting each other, sort of you know, emperors versus popes, but it also is playing out in sort of more local levels of these sort of disagreements about jurisdiction because university students are covered in, under canon law as well. Um, and so town gown conflict is something that very much exists in the Middle Ages. And one thing that complicates that is having university students sort of messing around and only being charged in a canon law court and not the local town law. Um, or the opposite, them being charged by a town law and the church coming in being like, you can't do this. <laughs> right, right. And that even applied to like certain members of of the clergy who who weren't like secular priests. Like I know how like how, how like friars are kind of this weird anomaly exception where like they're under ecclesial law, but they aren't necessarily subject to like whatever local bishop they're they're, they're under. They're like immediately subject to like the pope or, or, or whatever. And so that's also like a cluster cuss of like, you know, how exactly do we uh -huh. like try like friars who, who are misbehaving or, or something of that sort? Yeah, yeah. And I will also say that you people get like sort of transferred before different between different law codes in the Middle Ages as well. Um, and that's something that actually in the, the records that I deal with, I was sort of surprised to see that someone will be rather far into judicial procedure as in they'll be already kind of on the way to being executed. And then someone will write, actually, we realized that we found a cleric, our bad, we're sending them to our local diet, like our local ecclesiastical court. So people could get sort of transferred last minute, or there could be sort of these mistakes being made. So that suggests that perhaps this boundary could be a little bit fluid of people okay. being confused about who is subject to what jurisdiction. Um, and there also there also are a lot of crimes that technically could be covered in both. Um, so, for example, uh, sort of like marriage legislation and things is technically done by canon law courts, but also sometimes civil authorities are kind of trying to take it over in certain parts of the Middle Ages. Um, and also things like sort of inheritance and wills. Um, if someone's like broken an oath, that can be sometimes be canon law, but it can sometimes be secular law as well. Um, or sort of like matters of adultery and things of that nature. So things can kind of, or things like sort of heresy, blasphemy, um, sort of crimes related to sexuality. These are things that some canon law courts would sort of think belong to them, but also show up in secular law as well. So there is some sort of fluidity in the jurisdictional boundaries. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. That, that that's why I uh, well what I suspect it's simply... everything sound more confusing by just listing a whole bunch of things that could technically in some places be in two different court systems. But... Right. 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 All right. Well, um, Dr. Pardon, this has been a really fun discussion and an interview. I, I I figured maybe as as just like a couple closing questions, you know, what what books or or resource recommendations would you have for us who who might want to learn more about medieval law and, and jurisprudence? Okay, yes. So one of my favorite books about medieval law is um, Trevor Dean's Crime in Medieval Europe. Um, it is, however, focused mostly on the late Middle Ages. I think it's uh, like 1250 to 1500. Um, but great book, big, big fan. Um, a book that's more about kind of uh, kind of like intellectual history or sort of how the law has changed over time from the point of view of more sort of like jurists and things um, is Tamar Herzog's A Short History of European Law. Um, which does actually cover European law up into sort of almost a modern day, but has very good chapters on sort of the transition from sort of like Roman law in sort of the Roman Empire to what's sort of going on in medieval Europe and all of these sort of changes across the Middle Ages. 
Um, and finally, my third recommendation is from my sort of particular part of the world, which is late medieval Flanders. Um, Peter Arnade and Walter Provenier wrote this book called On Vengeance and Social Trouble, um, which is about pardon letters from the Burgundian Low Countries. So these are letters where someone has been sentenced to death and they're seeking a pardon from the Duke of Burgundy. Um, and so that's another sort of part of medieval law that is, I don't know, kind of important, um, but is that people were able to sort of seek pardons from, from high authority. So also sort of kings of France and England do this as well. Um, as a way that I think does kind of like establish their power to be able to pardon people and have this sort of constant stream of letters coming in and letters going out. Um, and also tell us a lot about what crimes could be considered excusable and why. Um, and what's great about that book is they have a lot of really nice translations of pardon letters as well, uh, which is a really cool way to kind of get into the material because they are like little stories um, of like, oh, I was here and then I did this and the person did this and then this happened. I really hope you give me a pardon for it, please. Hmm. That's so cool. Okay, okay. And then do, 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 I guess, you know, if, if I can just ask the closing question, do you have any closing comments or, or thoughts regarding medieval law and its its trajectory? Um, well, I should have prepared Sorry, maybe, my maybe closing else. thoughts. Um, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, I, so I will say that I think one thing that as, as a historian, I feel like we often try are fighting against like, the idea of a narrative of progress that we're almost like growing up in, I don't know, kind of like, you're growing up in like American culture, at least, I think there is this sort of subtle idea that things just kind of get better over time and people in the past were somehow just worse off and things are just sort of imp vaguely improving in some sense. You know, techn technology advances, things advance, blah, blah, blah. And I think that for me, studying medieval law has really shown the ways in which that's like very complicated and not always true, that medieval law is getting kind of like larger bureaucracies, is becoming more complicated, and it is in some ways getting like more of a kind of an intellectual activity, it's kind of being professionalized over the course of the medieval period, but also at the same time, like some things get better, some things get worse at the same time. Um, so for example, like the persecution of heresy gets a lot worse over the course of the Middle Ages, um, as does like the persecution of kind of like so-called sodomy or sort of a variety of different uh, sexual acts that are non-procreative, th that's something that the persecution of and punishment gets a lot worse as we move forward in time um and kind of the idea that just because things are getting kind of more organized or more systematized or we're moving forward in time and moving towards the early modern period we're approaching modernity that doesn't mean that <laughs> things are getting better sometimes right. things get worse sometimes things stay the same um history doesn't always sort of fit neatly into categories of improvement <laughs> right right all right well it's been a pleasure dr pardon thank you so much for coming on you're welcome. Thank you for having me.